On a Tuesday edition of Locked On Grizzlies, the dynamic duo is back together after a few episodes off. DeMichael and I are going to talk about his experiences there in FedEx Forum for the preseason opener against the Pacers. I've made a lot of people angry again, which is not surprising, over Derrick Rose this time around. So we'll talk about uh, the Michael's boy, Derrick. And then at the end, we'll preview Grizzlies Bucks, which of course is coming up tonight. All that and more on this episode of Locked On Grizzlies. Let's lock in. You are Locked On Grizzlies, your daily Memphis Grizzlies podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Any day is a good day when DeMichael Cole and myself are back together here on the Locked on Grizzlies podcast airwaves, if that's even a thing anymore, internet, streams, electronic All that good devices, stuff. whatever the technology is. You're not here for our engineering and electricity knowledge. You're here for some Grizzlies content, and that's what DeMichael Cole and I can provide pretty effectively here on Locked on Grizzlies. Free and available wherever you get your podcasts. You can also check us out over on YouTube, like, comment, rate, review, subscribe, all of those fun things. And today's episode of Locked on Grizzlies is brought to you by Jace Medical. Empower yourself when you purchase a Jace case, providing you with a personal supply of five antibiotics that treat 50 plus infections. Get yours today at jacemedical.com. That's J-A-S-E medical.com. I, Joe Mullinax of Bluff City Media, also a contributor from time to time over at SB Nation, joined by my co-host, as I mentioned, to Michael Cole of Commercial Appeal there in Memphis, Tennessee. Make sure you're following him on X or Twitter, whatever it's called, at the Michael C. <laughs> Follow me on Twitter at Joe Mullinax. And again, we're going to talk about Derek Rose. I had the show solo Sunday night into Monday, and I you know, got some folks heated at me which is par for the course, if we're being honest with one another. But DeMichael, I think, agrees with most of our commenters and repliers on social media. So that'll be a good conversation later in the show. Obviously, the Grizzlies play the Bucks tonight, and that is something that is, of course, worthy of discussion as Milwaukee heads into town, the connection with multiple coaches on the Grizzlies staff, all those fun things. But DeMichael, I, of course, in the recap episode on Monday and from Sunday night as well, talked about the idea of Grizzlies Pacers, some things to take away. I was very impressed with Kenneth Lofton Jr., Jake LaRavia, closing the game down the stretch. Valuable experience. I did talk about Rose, which we'll cover more here in a little bit. But just some overall takeaways of yours. Again, you as the beat writer for the Memphis Grizzlies there in Memphis. You were in FedEx Forum. You were there live. You were seeing the energy. I commented on how it felt like a regular season game in terms of the way that the fans were interacting. It seemed like a really fun environment considering it was October 8th and not, you know, May 8th, the second round of the playoffs. It was a fun environment, Joe. It, it, it was actually uh, – it, it was an engaged environment, you know, especially late in the fourth quarter you mentioned when Kenneth Lofton Jr. just getting the ball, especially in overtime. He's isolation, you know, getting isolation, scoring attempts, and, and the crowd's just into it. Uh, it was fun to watch. You know, granted, I was one of the people who said when it went to overtime that can they just please just, you know, uh, call it a tie so we can go to sleep or something. Like, it, Three season <laughs> overtime should not exist. It should. It's be. brutal. It's brutal. But <laughs> outside of that, uh, it was a it was a wonderful first day. And I mean, it was a Grizzlies typical Grizzlies game. Right. Uh, just thrilling uh, start to finish. But when you talk about takeaways, uh, when I talk to the players after the game, Joe, one thing that unprovokingly kept being said is well you know we're implementing this new offense well you know with this new offense or some some variants of that uh through various players now you've talked about it joe i've talked about it uh it's clear through taylor jenkins words uh but now we see players saying it and then too we got to see at least a little dose of it i think in that, that preseason opener you know they've only uh practiced for a little bit more than a week you know at this point so uh, we only got to see, you know, a little bit of it so far, but uh, they're actually going all in on this new offense thing. I believe uh, my guy Sean Coleman uh, said that the offense, uh, the half court offense, was already three points better uh, in this game. Now, granted, you know, it's 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 you know the the rotations and things like that will have to work out. The and Pacers I think that's, were not at full strength. The Pacers were not at full strength. 
Uh, but I think that is, I mean, it's a small positive. Considering, especially considering the Grizzlies were terrible from three point range, uh, they they did not shoot the three pointer well. And honestly, in a typical year, I'd say this might be a concern. But as long as Luke Kennard and Desmond Bain are taking the floor, I think you know those numbers will. Those guys will have plenty of games where they both will make multiple three pointers, and neither one of them made multiple three pointers in this game. So uh, I'm not you know putting too much stock into that just yet. Maybe eventually we will, but that's that's either here nor there. The point is, even though uh, the Grizzlies weren't shooting uh, at a, a high level from three-point range, they were still able to create efficient half-court offense. That has not been the case uh, really in the past. We've seen the shooting uh, go bad and the half-court offense go bad, you know, simultaneously. So uh, the players, I mean, I was talking to Zaire Williams, Desmond Bain, who two guys actually who were put in ball handling situations. Uh, John Conchar, Zaire Williams, your guy, John Conchar. Uh, Joe, you, you, you're making people mad again about uh, your John Conchar chase. I thought he looked good, Joe. What was wrong with him? people agree with me on that than they do on the Derrick Rose stuff. Yeah, I, I like well, There's a lot more support for my John Conchar take. It, it is. I, granted, but I liked Point Conchar. You know, it was. I did he, not. He, I was he, very, was, I, now, when I say. I, point Zaire than Point Conchar. See, and, and that's where I disagree at this point. But I think eventually. Oh, the Michael. I think I think eventually. But right now, you know, Zaire just looks like he's going through a little bit. We saw he had three turnovers, for example. John Conchar did not have a turnover. And his three turnovers, I think two of them were he got his pocket pick, you know, just dribbling the ball past half court. So you need to see Zaire get a little bit more comfortable in those situations where John Conchar was just making the right passes. I think he had no turnovers. He only finished with maybe one, one assist. But I'm sure he had a couple help assists. John uh, Conchar then, is malleable, like we've talked about before. Yeah, John I Conchar mean, is white rice that you put <laughs> various seasoning and vegetables. Like you go to a restaurant, yeah, like a Chinese you know. restaurant or a hibachi <laughs> grill, and all the delicious things go on top of the. He's the base, right? Like yeah. I would like some more spice and flavor in in my my uh, ceiling you, of basketball you, player. You you want that Sunday meal? You don't want that that, yeah. that Friday that Friday meal when you just go get something. You want that that Sunday meal? I want with a good little season. bit more flavor. Yeah. I want more flavor. I want more I opportunity for improvement. I get um, it. Conchar is what he is, and, and I get. I get this is a team, and it sounds counterintuitive because I talk about now they're trying to contend. Now they're trying to contend. Right, right, right. If if you trust Conchar more than Williams as a coach, then obviously it makes sense to play Conchar. But I, gosh, it's just so hard for me. He was the first sub. He was definitely the first sub. It's almost like we've reached great. Well, we have. It's not almost. We (laughs) have reached Grayson Allen territory with this guy. Um, I'm not sure that there's going to be much else that he's able to do. Uh, Real quick to Michael, before we move on to our – Next part of the show, uh, your takeaway on Jaron Jackson Jr. I talked about him a lot mm-hmm. on yesterday's show. He looked like he picked up right where he left off. You know, I sarcastically tweeted that if only Steve Kerr could have known that Jaron yeah, Jackson right. Jr. is a four and not a five. Uh, obviously, Stephen Adams didn't play a ton, but just the mm-hmm. fact that Jaron was back in his environment, seven stocks, five blocks, two steals. <laughs> Offensively, he looked like a mismatch. You would want to see Desmond Bain make more threes. But you That'll know they're eventually going to fall. Yeah. Seeing Jaron do those things, that really kind of put a nice bow on the night for me. Whether it was development from young players, whether it was the guys that you're counting on doing good things, it was almost like a prototypical first preseason game. It wasn't perfect, yeah. but you saw enough to be pretty optimistic about what the Grizzlies can be, even without John Moran. It was the variety of shots hmm. that, that Jaron was able to create. I mean, th- this half court offense thing, you, you can see. Uh, they're making some improvements, particularly uh, we saw a couple times where Jaron was you, – you talk about the Giannis comparison. You you usually say that. I, I don't say that, but I just want to say I, I the saw the flash. Yeah, yeah, granted. Yeah, of course. I, I don't think anyone's, you know, think you're calling him, you know, the MVP and all that. But with all that being said, it's – it's I feel like it's fair to, to kind of say you see the flashes – when he's getting the ball at the top of the key and the Grizzlies are giving him a running head start to get to the basket. We saw it a couple times where he hit a guy with a crossover and got to his right hand. He did it again, got to his left hand. And then we saw the spot up three point shooting. Right. And then we saw the post up where he got to his, you know, his patented left hand, you know, hook shot. 
Uh, so we saw him score in a variety of different ways. And in the past, even last season, when he improved last season, we saw him shooting at the three-point line, and we saw pretty much uh, the post-ups trying to take advantage of the mismatches. We saw a little bit of that more. I think in this game, we saw a bigger variety of ways he can score, and now they'll have to carry that over, and that'll help the uh, half-court offense even grow uh, more. Jaron Jackson Jr. was one of the MVPs of the game last night. The other MVP, begrudgingly for me, was Derrick <laughs> Rose. And I say begrudgingly because I vocalized an opinion on D. Rose, and I have been, you know, maybe correctly, maybe not correctly, uh, pointed out and called out for it. I'm going to let DeMichael, noted Derrick Rose supporter, uh, kind of talk through what he saw from D. Rose last night. Am I being too hard on him, that sort of stuff. They'll probably be a common topic here on Lockdown Grizzlies, but we're going to oh, revisit yeah. it next here on the show. Before we do that, though, this episode of Lockdown Grizzlies is brought to you by Jace Medical. Again, Jace Medical does a phenomenal job helping you be prepared to care for yourself in times of trouble. Everybody should feel empowered to have that ability for themselves and their loved ones when the unexpected happens. That's why Jace Medical offers the Jace Case, Jace Case provides five life-saving antibiotics excuse me, for emergency use and gives you a peace of mind so that you are not just hoping that you have access to medication in an emergency. Jace Medical makes sure that you have the medication in hand. It is simple, and Jace Medical handles everything from the online evaluation, licensed pharmacy medication delivery, ongoing consultation and care. Make sure you don't get unprepared make, and don't get caught being unprepared. Get $20 off on these life-saving antibiotics today from Jace Medical by using my code and our code here at Locked On Grizzlies, Locked On at, check, at checkout on jacemedical.com. That's J-A-S-E medical.com. When we come back here on Locked On Grizzlies, we will talk Derek Rose. DeMichael will probably yell at me a little bit. We'll have some fun. Stay with us. Welcome back to Locked On Grizzlies. I'm Joe Mullinax, joined by DeMichael Cole, the commercial appeal there in Memphis, Tennessee. He's the Grizzlies beat writer for that publication. I am of Bluff City Media, Memphis Grizzlies columnist, also a contributor over at SB Nation. Thank you for checking us out. Hopefully you're an everydayer who comes by each and every time there's a new episode of Locked On Grizzlies, wherever you get it, podcasts, YouTube. But if this is your first time coming through, thank you for checking us out. Hopefully you'll stick with us as the season grinds forth. Uh, as DeMichael and I continue to cover these Memphis Grizzlies. We talked about some in-person takeaways. Again, DeMichael was in FedEx Forum, had a chance to see the team up front and personal. One of the guys that he got to see up front and personal is Derek Rose, a Memphis legend, fair to say. It was pretty cool, I'm sure, for folks that had the connection. And I mentioned in the show uh, the, the most recent episode before this one. I, I wasn't there. I was in college when Derek Rose was in college. I'm 36, he's 35. So on one end, just physically, I can respect how he's still doing this uh, as, as I, you know, am very washed physically. He's, of course, a professional athlete with a lot more athleticism than me. But he's at a stage in his career where he's closer to the end than the beginning. And he struggled last season, which everybody conveniently likes to ignore, but I do not. He was not good for the New York Knicks last season, no matter what statistic you look at. Whatever explanation you want to give wasn't good. He comes in in one preseason game, and he looks the part of the veteran point guard. Obviously not the explosive athlete he once was. That's understandable. Most 35-year-olds, you know, abs op, excuse me, absent LeBron James, are not the same kind of player that they were 10 years prior. But the wiggle, the ability to move off the dribble, his efficient scoring, which I think is the least likely thing to continue, not because he's bad at scoring, but just because I would, you know, Desmond Bain's not going to shoot six for eight every night, right? Yeah, yeah. That's just not going to happen. Um, but I, I was most encouraged by his ability to handle and facilitate offense to Michael. I thought that was really good to see. If he can provide, you know, a couple of buckets in a row for a second unit once Marcus Smart is out there that desperately will need scoring, I think it really adds to his value. But I'm curious – you know, I'm more optimistic about, again, just helping facilitate the offense, getting the ball into other guys' hands, like a Luke Kennard, if that's going to be someone he plays alongside. Do you really think that he can sustain that level of scoring? Maybe not six of eight, but can he be a double-digit guy for the Grizzlies while he's in this role? I think so in this role. Uh, I mean, and here's the thing. You, we talk about last season, right? He struggled, uh, but – one, it was it was definitely a small sample size. It was the same exact sample size if you go back just the one year 
uh, before that because he played I think 27 games the year before that, 26 games last year, pretty much roughly around the same sample size. But you go back a year before that, he was shooting 6% higher from the field, from 38% to 44% from the field. He went from uh, – you go from 5.6 points per game to around 12 points per game and notably better three-point shooting as well. So, um, I mean, it's I, – I just don't think – in one year, he just completely just lost everything. And even if he did lose much, you know, uh, while sitting on the bench or whatever the case that was, or whatever happened last season with the Knicks, uh, ta- again, as I said pretty much throughout the summer, when I was talking to people in New York, they kept reiterating the fact that, hey, look, Derrick Rose sitting on the bench uh, with the Knicks while Miles McBride and Emmanuel Quickly and all those young guys got more of the minutes. Derrick Rose sitting on the bench. Don't be surprised if that kind of re-energizes him from a maintenance perspective. Derrick Rose is all about maintenance, management, his knees, his body, taking care of it. He even said it at media day, you know, how, you know, he mentioned the possibility of how, you know, sitting out all those games on the bench may have saved, it, saved some tread on his tires. And I think it's more of that's what more of what we're seeing than oh, this was kind of a a one-game, one-hit wonder thing. And let me add to that, because when I talk to the players after the game, this isn't even just me. Like, this is – I talk to the players after the game. I'm talking to to Desmond Bain, and Desmond Bain is like, I mean, I don't get why y'all are so surprised. And and this this is what Desmond Bain said. And a couple days before that, Desmond Bain was already talking about it. He was, man, Derrick Rose looks good. That's what he was saying. He looks good. And then Zaire Williams goes, tells me this story. I'm like, Zaire, when, when did you know? Like, we know old D. Rose. And De- Zaire is just, he's just, you know, uh, he's just he's just gushing about what Derrick Rose brings to the table. He's like, man, look, we were in a practice one day, and he hit me with this in-and-out crossover, and he was talking about how quick Derrick Rose still is. And he was like, I can't, like, if he's he's this quick now, Ten years ago, it's no way guys had a chance against him. Against him, so like these guys are like fans who are like soaking it up, but they they really think you know this is who he is, and you know the players have all the confidence in him. Clearly, Taylor Jenkins has confidence in what he brings to the table, and then there's the eye test, right? Uh, you saw the shiftiness, you saw two. I mean, the really quick crossovers. Like he still has the ability to get by guys and not elevate. Uh, like he used to. He can't do that. We saw once, you know, he got a shot blocked as he tried to, you know, go up with a floater. But we saw a couple other times where, where he finished. We saw he the pick and roll opportunity with Steven Adams where he, you know, uh, dished it off to Steven Adams, got the easy dunk. Uh, the playmaking, the shot creating. He, clearly he can create shots for himself still. He still can rock guys to sleep with the crossover. All of that will be bonus help uh, for this Grizzlies bench unit. I think the potential for him to average, you know, 8, 9, 10, 11 points per game is definitely there. I'm intrigued by him most in terms of beyond the Ja Morant suspension. When Ja is back, Marcus Smart obviously is going to be a key cog. You've taken a lot of time, and correctly so, it's fleshed out the idea of them needing point guards, combo guards that can create, facilitate offense. I wonder if the biggest thing coming out of this Again, it's been literally one preseason game that he played mm-hmm. 14 minutes in. So we need to see a larger sample size. For but sure. this this renaissance of Rose, if it does actually occur, which I think could happen, how that impacts you know their 10-man rotation. Like, is mm-hmm. it Conchar that gets knocked out? Is it mm-hmm. one of these young guys? Do they go small fairly consistently? Because if you knock out Conchar for Rose or Zaire Williams for Rose – Obviously, you've got another guard, point guard, basically, and yeah. that means you're probably playing Desmond Bain almost exclusively at the three as opposed yeah. to starting him there and then going a little bit bigger in spots. So yeah. I do think that Rose's success is going to create a good problem to have potentially if he is sure. able to do this consistently. Do you keep him in the rotation even when you have Smart and Morant healthy and available? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I think that that opportunity is definitely out there for sure. Uh, that the way that he's playing, uh, if he continues to play at this level, you're going to have to keep him on the floor. And the Grizzlies have that luxury because Marcus Smart can play on off the ball. It'll just say, hey, 
instead of him playing on the ball so much, now they'll even decrease his his usage there even a little bit uh, less. And he could play off the ball alongside of Derrick Rose. And again, getting to playing off the ball with Marcus Smart, it takes me to a bigger point. With Derrick Rose, we know the similarities between him and Ja uh, as players on the floor. And I can't understate how important that is for the Grizzlies to kind of get that look right now. Uh, He's not Ja at this point of his career. We know that. But similarities in games in terms of their attacking styles, the pressure that they put on the paint. I think Derrick Rose is kind of the perfect player that the Grizzlies can use and say, oh, we see how he's working. We can put Ja in similar situations and yield similar or even better success because of his levels of athleticism because he's going to get to the similar spots uh, that uh, – Derrick Rose likes to get to. So I think you can watch the Derrick Rose film and say, hmm, we're going to use Ja this way and that way. And it'll make the transition to incorporating Ja back into the lineup a little bit easier in terms of playing style and in terms of the rotation because Marcus Smart can play alongside of Derrick Rose and you can get a good look at that as well. I love the Marcus Smart more exclusively a combo guard as opposed to a true point guard. We saw that in Boston last year. I personally believe that's one of the main reasons Smart had a step back kind of season is he wasn't being used properly. I don't think he is that primary point guard at this stage. And maybe that even leads us, and this may be a topic for a later episode this week to Michael, if Rose continues this, is is Rose the fifth man? Is mm. it Rose, Smart, Payne, Jaron, and Adams? Like I think that, is, yeah. that could be a plot twist, and that would be interesting for the exact reason you just outlined. I think you might be onto something there. Maybe a, a, a Thursday edition of the show, we can touch on that, something like that. I, I think that's a good idea. But as we close out this episode of the podcast, when we come back, the Michael and I will take a look at Grizzlies Bucks. I said on the show yesterday, the opponent doesn't matter as much. You know, it'd be cool if Giannis and Dame play. They probably won't play much, if at all. You know, those sorts of things. It's more about the Grizzlies at this stage, and that's what yeah. the Michael and I will focus on next, going into preseason game number two on Lockdown Grizzlies. Stay with us. Welcome back to Lockdown Grizzlies. I'm Joe Mullinax, joined by DeMichael Cole, DeMichael of the Commercial Appeal there in Memphis, Tennessee. He's the Grizzlies beat writer for that publication. I of Bluff City Media. I'm the Memphis Grizzlies columnist for that website. Make sure you're checking us out on X, following us on YouTube, subscribing, wherever you get your podcasts, all that jazz. To Michael, Derek Rose probably will get another small sample size of minutes, 12 to 14. Same thing with Steven Adams, which, by the way, it was just awesome to see Steven Adams back out on the floor and getting good run. Didn't have a chance to talk about that as much, uh, yeah. but that was significant because there was concern that he wouldn't be able to do that. Uh, going into preseason two, preseason game number two, Again, the opponent is not as relevant as the Grizzlies themselves. What are some things that you're looking for in terms of execution, continued expansion of that new offense? It's only 48 hours really removed from their previous game. Mm -hmm. How much can you glean? How much can you gain from game one to game two? Do you stay with the same offensive sets and just hope for better execution? What, what's some stuff that you're looking for going into this uh, second preseason game? Yeah, I want to see some, some execution. Like you said, more of the same. Uh, with these lineups and things like that. Uh, now, one difference that we could potentially see, uh, haven't really talked to Taylor Jenkins about this yet, but there is a possibility that Luke Kennard, you know, switches out and another guy gets implemented into the starting lineup. One thing that Taylor Jenkins has kind of said throughout uh, preseason camp was that he wants to give several guys, you know, a look. So we saw John Conchar was first off the bench. Does that mean John Conchar gets inserted into that role? Or is it Zaire Williams, who was next up off the bench as well? Or one of those guys could potentially get the start. You bring Luke Kennard off the bench and play him into that role. I want to see if the Grizzlies will make that shift or if they go with Kennard again. If they go with Kennard again, I think the writing's probably on the wall for the way that the Grizzlies are leaning uh, in terms of starting lineup for the, for the season opener. Uh, that's the main thing I want to see. And then the offensive execution, just continued uh, offensive execution there. We know Taylor Jenkins and the way he emphasizes defense. Uh, I want to see who's going to guard the primary scorers on uh, the Milwaukee Bucks. If, if Dame Lillard's playing, uh, if, if John Conchar – if John Conchar starts, he probably draws draws the assignment. How does he match up there? If Luke Kennard starts, then does Desmond Bain get that assignment? Because for all great things, Derrick Rose in game one. Uh, the reason it's great that he's going to be a backup and not probably a long-term starter is defensively there are still some things that, you know, 
He's he's a little bit limited on that end. He's going to give you the effort, but he's a little bit limited on uh with that end. And we saw T.J. McConnell kind of take advantage of that a couple times. Uh, so it's probably not going to be Derrick Rose. Uh, are you going to give Desmond Bain that matchup? Is it going to be Luke Kennard? Probably not going to be Luke Kennard. So we got to figure out how that's going to uh, work out as well. I want to see how the Grizzlies will match up uh, from that side. And then more than anything, again, the offensive execution, the half-court offense, redrilling it, and just let's see what type of steps and progress they continue to make from game one uh, to game two. Kenneth Lofton Jr. Uh, continues yeah. to be a fan favorite. You know, He it, looked it's good. It's giving off Zebo vibes whenever he gets the ball on the low block. Obviously not quite to that level. I don't want to insult uh, the, the playoff runs that Zach Randolph led. But mm-hmm. there's definitely a vibe, right? And, and there's a feeling to that. And we can close out on this to Michael. Yeah. Do you see if this continues, starting with tonight, yeah. is there a lane for Xavier Tillman to lose his job as the fourth big? Because Santi Aldama is too versatile offensively has a frame that they can keep working with defensively. I, I think Santi is safe. Yeah. Oh, you well, for sure. A potential mm-hmm. loss of gig for Tillman if Lofton is able to show that he can defend it. To me, that remains the biggest thing. It's I, a, you know, we, we don't want to be in the business of judging people's bodies and frames, but I, I think Lofton still has some transitioning in terms of changing his body to do in, in order to fully be able to play the type of defense it's going to take for him to negate or to, or to bring closer the gap between yeah. himself and Tillman defensively. Because offensively, it's not a contest. It's, it's lost it's right now. Mm-hmm. But, you know, we know Taylor Jenkins is going to prioritize the defensive end, and I'm not sure Lofton's going to be able to match that at this stage. But at, at what point does it become almost undeniable for Taylor Jenkins watching Lofton Jr. score the ball the way he does? My short answer is it's, it's probably not going to happen, barring, you know, injuries and things like that uh, when he gets his opportunity when the Grizzlies are a little bit shorthanded. But uh, that that's what I think. Do, is that what I would do? Probably not. But here's why I think that's the case. And you basically got to you got to choose because the Grizzlies now have gotten into a nice groove where we're starting to see Santi Aldama. We saw this in Santi Aldama and Jaron Jackson Jr. are going to be sharing the floor together. We saw that rotation uh, play out in both halves. A so, ton of offensive versatility with those guys. On cl- the floor. Clearly, Taylor, the light the light is on. He saw that two-man lineup was the best two-man lineup on the Grizzlies uh, in the late part of last season. Uh, and we saw the same thing with Desmond and Luke Kennard being the second best. But those guys are getting on the floor more together. The point I'm making is – Santi is becoming an even bigger part of the Grizzlies going forward. We know what Steven Adams and Jaron Jackson Jr. is. And the thing is, it's hard for me to see the two bigs being Lofton and Santi. In other words, if you're going to play Santi Aldama as much as the Grizzlies are, you probably need another uh, defensive-minded backup reserve uh, to, to match up with that. For example, here's, here's a rotation uh, point that's probably going to have to play out. If you put Kenneth Lofton Jr. on the floor, Looking Lofton Jr. on the floor, you're probably going to have to match him up with Jaron Jackson Jr. Jaron Jackson Jr. You know uh, is is going to have to probably protect the rim and things like that. Uh, and and Kenneth Lofton Jr. is a very good rebounder, but those two are going to have to be on the floor together. You're not going to put Kenneth Lofton Jr. on the floor with Stephen Adams, and putting him on the floor with Santi Aldama puts you at a very big defensive advantage. So Jaron Jackson Jr. is the one guy that he's going to have to share the floor with. But if you put those two on the floor together, now you're limiting the Santi Aldama, Jaron Jackson Jr. menace. So, again, it's a ripple effect here. And overall, I think uh, the Grizzlies will just lean more towards Xavier Tillman Sr. Uh, for that type of fit. It, because if basically if you play Lofton Jr., you're succeeding uh, the Santi Aldama, uh, Jaron Jackson Jr. parent that has been really good for the team. And I don't know if they're ready to do that just yet. So I think uh, Xavier Tillman Sr. keeps his role. They have time when it comes to Lofton Jr., which is the good news. Obviously, oh, yeah. X, you know, in terms of free agency, may not be long for the Grizzlies world beyond this season. You have till uh, you have Lofton Jr. that can continue to develop and, and find his footing literally uh, yeah, as a yeah. lateral quickness defender. I think you're right on about who he can play with. And if that's the only guy that he can really align himself with, you have other options. Steven Adams, right? Like you want those guys to see – 
time with Jaron so he can truly be the best version of himself and not have to overcompensate for other people. I do think that matters. We'll see how it goes tonight in FedEx form. Again, to Michael Cole will be there live and in person. And that's what he'll be discussing, I'm sure, on our Wednesday edition of the podcast. DeMichael will be flying solo for that one. Uh, DeMichael, anything else beyond Grizzlies Bucks that you have cooked up for the Wednesday show? Uh, I, I, I don't know just yet, but I, I'll say that uh, I, this game, I think we'll have a lot of big takeaways from this game because now we'll be two games in. We're going to see what the team's going to improve mm-hmm. on and all of that good stuff. And uh, we get to see Derrick Rose. Uh, I want to see Desmond Bain and Luke Kennard shoot the ball more efficiently this time around. It's a lot, to, lot, lot more we can see uh, that we can have some bigger takeaways after this game. And you'll be almost exactly two weeks away from opening night. Yeah, Memphis Grizzlies. So lots of different things. Uh, a solid chunk of the preseason will be done once that Grizzlies Bucks game has concluded. So it's going to be fascinating to watch unfold. I can't wait to check out that Wednesday episode of Locked On Grizzlies, and then I'll be back to help close out the week, the last couple of shows. Thank you so much for checking us out wherever you get your podcasts, YouTube, like, comment, rate, review, subscribe, all those fun things. Spread the word of Locked On Grizzlies. Share the good news that DeMichael and I will be with you almost each and every day from now until the end of the NBA season. Lots to discuss, lots of exciting things regarding this team. Make sure you're following along wherever you get your podcasts as well as on YouTube. For DeMichael, I'm Joe. We'll catch you next time. Until then, stay locked in. This is Locked on Grizzly.